All right. Thanks very much, everyone. Pleasure to be with you all today. Rapa Nui, or Easter Island, is a place that is still enshrouded in great mystery. We're still learning a lot about the culture. We're still learning a lot about the archaeology. And one thing that has been virtually untouched is the natural history. Rapa Nui is approximately 2,300 miles west of the South American coast, 1,300 miles east of the Pitcairn Islands, which are the closest island chain. At 63 square miles, Rapa Nui is so remote that the ancient Polynesians refer to it as Te Pito Te Huena, or Naval of the World. Now this is an artist's concept of what Rapa Nui looked like prior to the arrival of humans. It was once a palm-dominated scrub woodland. And if you think about it, this very remote island, very isolated, those plants and animals that were fortunate enough to make it to the island and ultimately colonize the island were winning the proverbial lottery. And with that, you have to think about this, is, is that the island was incredibly fragile given the fact that it was so remote. This wasn't a very biodiverse place. It never has been, given its isolation. And as a result of that, it was highly sensitive to environmental perturbations such as drought and extreme weather events, bad, big storms, as well as human activities. The ancient Polynesians arrived between 800 and 1200 CE. Fast forward a few hundred years, on April 5, 1722, Dutch explorer Jacob Rogoveen arrived on Easter Sunday and unimaginatively enough, dubbed it Easter Island. Once again, this is that artist concept image that we have here. And me going crazy with the slide. Wow, that's interesting. This is the artist concept here at left. Once again, this is an image that I took in 2008 of roughly the same area. And what I'd like to illustrate by this side-by-side -side comparison is there is a dramatic difference between what Rapa Nui once looked like and what we see today. Within a mere five to 800 years, the landscape of Rapa Nui was largely deforested and transformed into a grassland. Now many folks attribute this transformation to human activities, but that's only part of the equation. Once again, Rapa Nui was very remote. The ecosystem was very fragile. The arrival of humans was inauspiciously timed with a severe drought period. As a result, the combination of drought, human activities, and island and ecosystem fragility, uh, what resulted in what is called a catastrophic ecological shift, where the island shifted from this palm-dominated scrubland to a grassland. A couple of hundred years later, the Europeans arrived, transformed the entire island into a sheep herding operation. And this went on for about 100 years. And I refer to this as the final nail in the ecological coffin of Rapa Nui. And this is what Rapa Nui looks like today, as you can see, dramatically different than what the first Polynesians saw. There are no native stands of trees remaining on Rapa Nui. All terrestrial vertebrates have gone extinct. Of the 424 known invertebrates that occur on the island, over 95% of those are non-native invasive species. They were introduced either by or by humans either intentionally or unintentionally. Less than 5% are endemic to the island, meaning that they occur on Rapa Nui and nowhere else on the entire planet. So when I arrived there, I knew that there was, that there was this large number of non-native invasive species that occurred there. So I, when I arrived at Rapa Nui, I had one question, one burning question in mind, and that is, do endemic invertebrates still exist in caves? So that was my mission. That's what I set out to do. But before I could address that question, we had to ask the spirits for approval. 
And we did this by conducting what is called an umuhatu. It's a traditional ceremony, Polynesian ceremony. We dug a deep pit. We had a large fire in the pit. We lined it with basaltic lava rocks to heat the rocks. We then layered food wrapped in banana leaves with those hot rocks, covered it with, with uh, dirt, left it for several hours, came back, unearthed it. Once that was done, you can see me here, unearthing the chicken and the fish. My good friend, Lasaro Pakarati, who was a Rapa Nui uh, Council of Elders member, he led me in a, because I was the expedition leader, I had to ask the spirits in Rapa Nui for permission to enter the caves. So after he guided me through the process, we had a large meal, we left the pit unearthed during the entire time that we were working underground, just as further assurance that we were going to be okay. And at which point we had permission by the ancestors to conduct our work. This is a Landsat image of Rapa Nui. This is our study area in the, blue, in the uh, red square there. This is merely that, the inset of that red square that you saw on the previous slide. We had 10 study caves, you can see here in red. And so we were studying the cave arthropods of these, of, of these 10 caves. And because we wanted to have some assurance when we were going to say that, okay, these animals might be cave restricted, we wanted to be able to compare that to something. So in order to do that, we deployed two surface sampling grids so we could collect arthropods on the surface as well. For sampling our caves, we used six traditional arthropod sampling techniques, which were applied systematically across all 10 caves. And to sample the surface, we, as I mentioned, we deployed two pitfall trap sampling grids, which were deployed for a total of 10 days, 20 traps per grid. And our trap construction was basically a PVC pipe, very low tech. You inserted a, P, you inserted a te glass test tube inside it, filled it halfway with propylene glycol, countersunk it into the, onto the ground surface, and whatever fell in was trapped and preserved. As a result of our cave sampling effort, we identified 60 cave-dwelling species. Not surprisingly, given that very large number of non-native invasive species, 50 of those were introduced either intentionally or unintentionally by humans. But 10 of those animals were endemic species, restricted to the cave environment, and eight of those were new to science. So we answered our question, caves do indeed still harbor cave-restricted animals on Rapa Nui. <laughs> the pre-Socratic philosopher Heraclitus once said, nature is wont to hide herself. And that could not be more true for Rapa Nui and those endemic animals that occur within. There have been entomologists over the past 100 years that have sampled the surface. They detected none of these new animals. We deployed those two surface sampling grids. We did not detect them on the surface either. They were located within these caves. And specifically, we believe the moss fern gardens featured here in this slide are, those, are what is called source habitats for these animals. I would also like to point out that eight of those endemic species were island endemics, meaning that they occur on Rapa Nui and nowhere else. <laughs> Interestingly, two of those we identified as being Polynesian endemics, meaning that they occur on Rapa Nui, but also on neighboring Polynesian islands as well. I would also like to point out that none of those animals that we discovered that were cave restricted were cave adapted. They did not evolve to a life specifically underground. These are eight of our 10 new species featured here. You can see a couple of isopods. We have what is called a book louse. Y'all might be familiar with those if you have any old books and you open it up and all these little white ant looking things just scurry out. It's these guys. These are springtails or columbula. And when we're thinking about this idea of, of animals being cave restricted, over the years, there have been two hypotheses that have been applied to, to explain cave restriction. One has been applied to the temperate regions of the globe, the other to the tropical regions. To date, there was no means of explaining cave restriction for animals that were not cave restricted. 
So in a paper that we had recently published in the journal Bioscience, we put forward the disturbance relic hypothesis. Now what this hypothesis states is, is quite simple. Animals that once enjoyed, or organisms for that matter, that once enjoyed a more wide range. Perhaps these animals, I believe, were most likely ranged throughout the entire island. But I, animals that once enjoyed a wide range are now restricted to a former portion of their range due to extensive and intensive human disturbance. But what about those two Polynesian endemics? We have a Kalimbala here, springtail, and then we have this terrestrial isopod. Well, when we're talking about animals, and plants for that matter, that can disperse from island to island, or from mainland to island, there are three primary mechanisms in which that occurs. The first one is by wind currents. So we wanted to say, we wanted to know, hey, was it possible for these animals to have been, become part of the aerial plankton and be transported from somewhere else, ultimately to Rapa Nui? Well, there are no known examples for either Kalimbala or isopods as being part of the aerial plankton. So we were able to exclude that as being a possibility. We wanted, there was another possibility. What about foracy? Now, foracy is just a fancy ecological term for hitchhiking. You know, like if you have head lice, you're, you're foritically transferring that head lice to your friend, or, to your, or maybe not your friend, but someone you want to give the lice to. Um, but that's basically what it is. It's the foritic transfer. And so we were wondering, okay, is it possible that these animals clung on to a bird, a pelagic bird, and were able to get from one island to the next? Once again, no known examples for either Kalimbala or isopods. So finally we thought, well, hey, what about rafting? Big storm event occurs, big tree gets knocked into the ocean, set adrift, all the while, these animals are clinging on for their dear lives. Boom, bump into the shores of Rapa Nui. Happy times, they hop off, establish a, a, a colony, and hey, they have a new home. Well, this, this seemed logical. We were like, wow, maybe this happened. So we further entertained this idea by looking at an oceanic currents map. And these are the areas in which those animals occur. And let's look at our Kalimbala first. There's over 7,000 kilometers of open ocean between Hawaii, where this Kalimbala was first identified and described, it was a new species at the time, and Rapa Nui. A lot of ocean, right? Tremendous amount of water to, cr to cross. But more importantly, look at these oscillating bands, these very predominant cross currents occurring along the equator. So it would seem that dispersal by drifting across those seems most unlikely to completely improbable. Our second animal, the isopod, 3,400 kilometers between Rapa Iti and Rapa Nui. And you can see here that the South Pacific gyre does spiral in the general direction of Rapa Nui. So this seemed like it could be a possibility. But I would like to point out that Rapa Nui is this tiny 63 square mile speck in the middle of the South Pacific Ocean. So this seems like an unlikely scenario. We believe that the ancient Polynesian navigators aided in the dispersal of these animals. And we put forward the canoe bug hypothesis in that same paper that I just mentioned, which was published in Bioscience. And we were able to hang our hat on this idea because we know about canoe plants. The Polynesians would load these voyaging canoes with plants that they would like to have when they reached the next island. They would have food, plants for food. They would have plants for medicinal purposes. They would have plants for making clothes, ropes, nets. And they would put these plants oftentimes in gourds, and in it would be soil. And it's not like they went through this dramatic or extensive sterilization process before they would load it onto one canoe and unload it at their next destination. So whatever soil-dwelling arthropods were within that gourd or transported to the next island. And this is our canoe bug. This is a new species of terrestrial isopod. And we named it, the genus is Stylonaceus, and the species name is Manuvaca. Manuvaca is Rapa Nui for canoe bug. Uh. <laughs> 
So we have these 10 endemic arthropods that, are, that live and are persisting somehow amid over 400 non-native invasive species. We have this dramatic change that occurred in Rapa Nui from one ecosystem to another. So what is the future of these animals? Well, I identified all of these animals as being imperiled species. I believe that they are indeed in trouble, and I do believe that they require strict management protocols to somehow ensure their persistence into the near future. And I used three lines of evidence for that. The first one is this idea of extinction deaths. We detected half of those endemics by, few, fewer, or by two or fewer individuals. Very few individuals did we, were we able to actually capture and identify as being one of those 10 species. And we know that extinction, with extinction deaths, that organisms will hover near or at extinction thresholds for multiple generations before ultimately going extinct. Secondly, on the Hawaiian Islands, roaches and millipedes, the roach species is Periplaneta americana, which is the American cockroach, Oxidus gracilis, which is a garden millipede. These two species have been identified as threatening the persistence of cave-dwelling arthropods on the Hawaiian Islands. These, these were the first and second most abundant arthropod species detected during our cave sampling efforts. Finally, climate change. Climate change is real. Climate change is happening. There's no smoke and mirrors there. It's really going on. And the IPCC, a couple of years ago, they, they produced this report every, few year, every several years, have indicated, and basically this was what was resonated from 2007 as well, that precipitation in the warmer subtropical regions is anticipated to decline. More drought will occur in the subtropics. Rapa Nui is a subtropical island. What does this spell for those fern moss gardens? Well, I predict that some of those might ultimately become extirpated. They might die off in some of the caves. In other cases, they may become seasonal occurrences. And in still other cases, they may persist with little or no impacts. But, but as a result of that possibility, we don't know what that's going to mean for these endemic arthropod populations. But there is a great silver lining that I see here. I mentioned earlier that 21 of those species prior to our work were identified as endemics. We now have 31 endemic species of arthropods on Rapa Nui. One third of them are cave restricted. So by simply protecting caves on Rapa Nui, we may be able to at least temporarily safeguard these populations into the near future. I've recommended to Rapa Nui National Park that those caves supporting these animals as well as caves supporting these fern moss garden habitats be closed until we can more accurately determine the distributions of these animals on the island as well as get a, at least a basic understanding concerning their natural history and their population structure. Also, if the park ultimately decides that it is a good idea to open, reopen some of these caves, this is a very low-tech management strategy that we can use, simply roping off these fern moss gardens and providing placards and signs at both in front of these habitats and on the surface at the trailheads, instructing visitors concerning the fragility of these habitats and asking them not to trample these habitats can go a long way to protecting them. And finally, captive breeding programs. I mean, we're talking about really tiny bugs here, folks. So you got a Tupperware container, you got some dirt, you got something to feed them. There's a very good chance that you would be able to rear them in your home. I think we could set up these captive breeding programs <laughs> in, in secondary schools and, and, give this, and provide students and, and the Rapa Nui community with the ability to more firmly embrace their dwindling natural history. So this is a great opportunity here. And with that in mind, Maruru Roa, which is Rapa Nui for thank you very much. Great job. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you so, so much. Very well, well done. Thank you very much, Jet.